Warning, the following program contains scenes of death. The 11 11 with over 100 stores to serve you. Thank you, Natalie. Here are the Mills Brothers with CJCU. I waste away half my days. Yeah, I think I might look alive for what you like. If you fall on me, fall out. You turn me inside out. And my heart's not enough. early in the afternoon when the father and son out fishing rowed their boat to shore so they could eat their lunch together. As the son bit into his peanut butter and jelly sandwich, he looked down at the concrete block that he was sitting on and sticking out of it was a hand. When police arrived, they found seven more concrete blocks in the water. In the cracks in the concrete, you could see signs of human flesh. We believe the party to be a female, young female. It could be between 14 to 24 years of age. Less than 20 miles away, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka had finished their vows, and they were now husband and wife. The pretty young stiff were 14-year-old schoolgirl Leslie Mahaffey. She'd been missing about two weeks. She'd come home late, out drinking, Mourning the loss of a friend who'd been killed in a car accident. When she got home at about 2 a.m., her parents had locked the doors. I guess to teach her a lesson. And she disappeared off her front lawn into thin air. And when she showed up on the bottom of a lake bed, she'd been brutalized, raped, tortured, and fucked in just about every hole you can be fucked in. And yeah, I know that sounds offensive, but this ain't the Disney Channel. This is for grown-ups. You can tell, because there's no mouse ears in the corner of the screen. And yeah, sure. The young teen had missed a curfew, but she paid for that with her life. And uh, then she took a breath, and that freaked me out even more. I w he should have slapped me in the face because I was really hysterical then. So he went over to her and he did the same thing, he strangled her more. And I think I watched that time because I thought, what the hell, she's dead anyway. Like... Paul Bernardo and Carla Mocha. Well, they seemed like the perfect couple. And they even had the teeth to match. But nothing in this world is what it seems. Nothing. I guess to an outsider, Bernardo seemed like an average kid. Cheerful, always a smile on his face. But inside the Bernardo family's closed doors, there were some dark secrets. When he was only eight years old, his father was charged for molesting a neighborhood girl. It was then that Paul's older sister admitted to him that she were also being fucked by the father. And to make things worse, around this time Paul's mother told him that his father wasn't really his father and that she'd had an affair and he were illegitimate. So it seemed the happy-go-lucky, charming little kid had more than one dark secret. Carla Homoka, on the other hand, <laughs> well, she were a real peach. The middle of three sisters, hard-working parents, the girls never wanted for anything, and every guy wanted to get into her pants. But one friend recalled a bizarre incident when Carla was a teenager, where she wanted to dig up the family pet and take a look at it after it had been buried for a year. And when she dug the cat up, she didn't even shed a tear. She also told friends in high school that she was looking for an older man with money. So when she met Bernardo in a Toronto club, I guess there's no surprise she was smitten. Five years her senior, drove a nice car, had a job as a junior accountant. Yeah, sure, he were 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. 
But isn't that what every 17-year-old girl is looking for? Precision skating was Kristen's first love. When she strapped on her skates as a young child, gliding across the ice was her passion. She was an accomplished skater, and she has the medals to prove it. But Kristen never wanted to show off. Kristen was... I don't like being by myself, you know? I'm really suspicious of people walking down the street. I judge them. An entire generation of students at Holy Cross and beyond have been emotionally scarred by Kristen's murder. In the spring of 87, the year that Paul met Carla, that a series of brutal rapes began to take place in Scarborough, a quiet suburb of Toronto, often on the victim's own property in broad daylight. The attacker would attack from behind, often ass fucking his victims and leaving without them ever seeing his face. The victims also reported that their attacker would take some of their personal items, pictures, photo albums, leaving them feeling vulnerable and open to further attacks. In several of the attacks, the victims reported getting up, dressing, and then the attacker would reveal himself again, only hiding in a wardrobe or behind a closed door, then start all over again. The rapist was prolific, often attacking twice a week. When FBI profilers were called in, they warned the police that it was only a matter of time before these rapes would escalate into murder. The rapes, as brutal as they were, and considering most of them were on young teenagers, had the city in a state of terror. People were locking their doors, even in broad daylight, and the ass fucking scumbag were given the title of the Scarborough Rapist. But if I'm being honest here, I would have preferred the ass fucking bandit, which I feel is more catchy. Bernardo was now spending most of his time at the Homoko family home after becoming engaged with Carla. The couple, saving for their own home, had moved in with the parents. And although Carla were completely subservient to every need, including Bernardo pissing and shitting on her, ass and them, bondage, bringing home girls and having threesomes that they meet in clubs, Bernardo still resented Carla because he knew he wanted the first one. Her 15-year-old sister Tammy, on the other hand, had virtue and innocence that Carla never had. Sweet as a peach and twice as ripe, Bernardo made it no secret that he wanted to take her virginity. In fact, he'd already admitted to Carla that once, while driving her underage sister out to buy booze for her party, the two had got drunk together and made out in his car where he finger fucked her. And he'd often sneak into her bedroom at night and masturbate on her while she slept. One time she woke up and squeezed his ball sack while he was turning. But now he told Carla he had a taste for it and he wanted to take their relationship to the next level. It was then that Carla decided to offer up her sister as the sacrificial lamb and suggested that they have a threesome together at Christmas. The perfect gift for her beloved husband. It was Christmas Eve that Carla decided to put her plan into action. After a dress fitting, her and her sister went over to a veterinarian hospital which where she worked. And while her sister waited in the car, she picked up some animal anesthetic. 
By all accounts, that Christmas Eve, the group started drinking early, with Carla stealing some of her mother's sleeping pills and putting them in her younger sister's drink to help the process. The perfect cocktail. Tammy's death clock were not ticking. When Carla's parents and older sister decided to call it a night at around 11 p.m., Carla excused herself to go into the kitchen to make more cocktails. Paul sat on the couch with Tammy and started kissing her and putting his hand up her top. Perhaps worried that her older sister would walk in and catch him, she rejected Paul's advances. It was shortly after this that she passed out and Paul started fucking her while Carla filmed it and held a cloth soaked in anesthetic up to her sister's face so she wouldn't wake up. The videotape then shows Paul take the camera while Carla goes down giving her sister a head. It was during this ungodly threesome that the mix of alcohol and anesthetic must have been too much for the young girl's heart and she stopped breathing with Carla trying to revive her and eventually calling 911. But the girl died. By neighbors' accounts, the parents were hysterical. And Carla's mother, still in a nightdress, threw herself out on the front lawn into the snow, sobbing and screaming like a banshee. Not my baby. Oh God, please. Not my baby. It's now 1991, and Paul and Carla have moved out of her parents' house to let them grieve the loss of the youngest daughter, who they believe has died from choking on her own farming, from alcohol poisoning, death by misadventure. It was at this exact same time that in the city of Scarborough, the city's most prolific rapist in its history, was taking a break after four years, and it seemingly stopped altogether. But not before one of his last victims got a look at his face. And the police now had a description of the rapist, who had over a hundred rapes to his name. It was when the EFIT was released that Bernardo's acquaintances couldn't phone the cops quick enough. When police approached Bernardo and asked for a blood sample along with saliva, he happily cooperated, knowing with DNA in its infancy, it could take years for them to find the results. It had been nine months since the pretty grade nine student, Leslie Mahaffey, had vanished from her front yard in Burlington and turned up cut into neat little pieces at the bottom of a lake left for the eels. And the cops still didn't have a goddamn clue. Yeah, sure, they had theories. Prostitution rings. Jealous boyfriends. But at the end of the day, it held as much water as a retard wearing floaties in a baby pool. And the parents gave up wondering and just accepted that God can be cruel. <laughs> it were eight months since Leslie Mojave went missing and over a year since Carla's sister went down due to a threesome gone bad, that the syphilitic lovebirds were out on the prowl again. Fifteen-year-old high school student, Kristen French. She were as sweet as a piece of apple pie with a scoop of vanilla ice cream on top. Straight-A student, popular, a member of the rowing team, Hell, she was such a good figure skater that she were being considered for the Olympics. The pretty young student was last seen after leaving her school, being forced into a cream-colored Camaro by a young woman and a man. Several other witnesses reported seeing that same cream Camaro and two young women fighting in the back seat while it sped through the side streets. Eyewitnesses that uh... Kristen was, ab was abducted from that parking lot. Little did Canadian cops know that the happy newlyweds, Paul and Carla, only lived a 10-minute drive from where Kristen were abducted. But now, with the FBI involved, they didn't need to find the stiff to know that they had a serial killer on the loose. 
and they had now linked Kristen French's disappearance with the murder of Leslie Mahaffey. It was then that they started the Green Ribbon Task Force to hunt down what they now believed to be a serial killer. It was two days after Kristen's disappearance that a father went live on TV to plead for his daughter's life. That we are thinking of you and that everything can be done is being done. And we'll get you back real quick. But little did he know that his daughter was only four blocks away being held as a sex slave in a basement. But by all accounts, Kristen French were made of stronger stuff than Leslie Mahaffey. And as the video shows, she even pretended to like sex with Paul and Carla, even when he were given her anal. Some would say, if she were an actress, it were the performance of her life. Or better still, a performance to save her life. Kristen had even got clever and told Paul that she preferred anal sex. And while Carla was away at work, Paul used the couple's expensive champagne glasses that were a gift for a wedding and had a glass of champagne with Kristen. When Carla came home, she was furious. Sans and Paul were starting to enjoy his new fuck toy. After three days' captivity, she ordered him to finish the job. So he strangled her with the electrical cord of his video game console. And Carla cut off all the kid's hair. Then the killer couple threw her in the trunk of their car and drove her and dumped her in a ditch by the side of the road. And Carla fucked Paul in the front seat while the body lay 10 feet away. And they were only half a mile away from where Leslie Mahaffey's body were buried. Kristen's nude body was found two weeks later in a ditch full of trash. It was at this point that Paul and Carla's relationship started to go downhill. Carla was still pissed off that Paul seemed to enjoy Kristen just a little too much. Yeah, sure. Carla didn't mind dressing up in her dead sister's clothing and pretending to be her for Paul's sexual gratification. But she drew the line when Paul asked her to dress up in Kristen French's school dress. And she told him as much and an argument ensued. And I guess it was then that Paul gave Carla the beating that he figured she had coming. So Carla packed up her bags and she left to move back to her parents. It was at this very same time that the DNA test that Paul submitted two years earlier when he was questioned about being the Scarborough rapist, the DNA test taken by over 300 suspects came back positive. The Paul Bernardo with the Scarborough rapist. And when cops went and asked Carla about it, well, I guess because she were bitter, she started singing like a retard with a Mr. Microphone on Christmas morning. And the gig were up for Bobby and Ken. I'm nothing without you. I'm nothing. We were a good team, you know. We're the best team, you know. We were great, man. You know, do we stand together? We fall? I'll do a fall for it, okay? You keep standing, pal. I gotta go. But Tie I got... me up, I don't want to fly away. Tie me down somehow in a quiet place. Better the home by Better the love you gave Better than the wide world Better the silence Wait, wait, wait.
you know, other other than that, I don't remember. You know, maybe I've never heard that. Turn the city down. It's too loud or low. Better the hummingbird. Better the love you gave. Better than the wider world. Better the sound. ahead to things that you will be able to do. Was she even older? She had a child. At least I'd have had a granddaughter on her. Watching the grass grow. The book says no more.